We live in a world which struggles to be hopeful about the future. A world that's dominated by bad news. Faced with environmental crisis, political turmoil, natural disasters, economic uncertainty. Faced with our mortality, sickness, and even death. We struggle to be hopeful about the future. But there is good news. And our world desperately needs to hear it. And that good news is not an abstract hope or optimism, but is a decisive intervention by God in history. And this is the beginning of the good news. Did you see how Mark's gospel starts, that lovely phrase? Um, The word gospel, of course, means good news. And um, sometimes it's a little bit unhelpful that we call the four gospels gospels because it confuses things slightly. They contain the good news. They're not the good news in themselves, if you see the, the distinction Mark says, here is the beginning of the gospel, the good news, which I am going to declare to you. And um, Mark's gospel is brilliant. It is unprecedented. It's never been done before. We believe this is the first, uh, the earliest of the gospels. And it's got this breathless sense to it. It is, um, it rattles through at speed. It's um, as exhilarating as the events which it is describes. It's generally have um, reckoned to be um, completed um, before about 70 AD. Um, It's anonymous. We don't know who wrote it for sure, but Mark is a pretty good guess. Mark is an associate, a friend of Peter, the apostle. And there's a reference in uh, one of Peter's letters where he says, uh, she who is in Babylon sends you her greeting, as does my son Mark. He's not Peter's actual son, but is like a son to Peter. And so if that's right, and I think it is, then this gospel is written by one who knew Peter, one who knew those who knew Jesus very well indeed. But also it's written in the context of a a very dramatic time in history. Rome was in turmoil. Uh, There was an emperor called Nero who's famous for his dreadful persecution of Christians. Peter had had been or was about to be uh, murdered for his witness to Christ. And the church was scattered across the world. And um, those who had been eyewitnesses of the events of the gospel story were coming to the end of their lives. And so Peter must have said to Mark, listen, you're going to have to write this down. You're going to have to write this down so that others can hear. And so what we have is an experience that must be something like sitting down with the great apostle Peter and having him tell you the stories of what happened and what he was a witness to. And they're not just great stories. They do a job. There's a purpose here. That this is good news for you. That is, this is there to shape you, to give you hope that you might be good news for your world. We proclaim hope, good news in an often desperate world. And it begins with this phrase. This is the beginning of the gospel. This is the beginning of the good news. It might seem like an obvious way to start, um, but it's very interesting actually Uh, You may know Mark's gospel doesn't have an ending, or it does, but it's terrible, or it's not really a very sort of satisfying ending, because it ends with these words, Mark 16, verse 8. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. Full stop. The end. That's a strange way to finish a gospel. But I think it's intentional. I know it's intentional. I know it's purposeful. Because what Mark is saying is this is the beginning, but the end hasn't happened yet. And in fact, the end is happening as we speak. The church is proclaiming the good news around the world. You are the continuation. And you 
Tonight, in Chateau Day, are part of that same story. Here is the beginning of the good news. You are what's next. So that's quite exciting, isn't it? A few reflections on these opening verses of Mark's Gospel. It begins with a a quotation from the Old Testament and a figure who is really very Old Testament. So uh, it begins with these words. As it is written in the prophet Isaiah, I will send my messenger ahead of you and he will prepare your way. And I think that matters a great deal, that sort of Old Testament connection, because what's happening here isn't new. It is the culmination of everything that happened in the Old Testament. That John the Baptist, who we're talking about here, is this kind of pivotal figure in the Bible. He's the bridge between the Old and the New Testament. He's the one promised, and he is the one who, well, he's got that... um, real kind of Old Testament prophet feel to him, hasn't he? And um, he was a really big deal. Do you remember um, one time John Lennon got in a lot of trouble for suggesting that the Beatles were bigger than Jesus? And he was wrong, but he got in a lot of trouble for it. But here's an interesting thing. For a time, John the Baptist was bigger than Jesus. He was such a big deal. Look at uh, verse 5. The whole city and the countryside went out to see John the Baptist. It was a a, a massive popular uprising, a sort of revival of a messianic hope. And it had an enormous implication. The religious leaders didn't know what to do about it because all of the people were going out into the wilderness to be baptized by John. And even the infamous governor, Herod, saw him as a serious threat. And you know what he did to him in the end. And John the Baptist himself said, I must decrease so that Christ might increase. He's a hugely significant figure, the the greatest of the Old Testament prophets, but his job is to point to the one who is to come. But just let's look at him for a moment, because um, he lives this kind of very radical, this very sort of, um, uh, uh, this, this incredibly simple prophetic life. Verse 6, he wore clothing made of camel's hair, a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. It's not just that he looks like an Old Testament prophet. He, he is that. And he inhabits the wilderness. He lives in kind of conscious challenge to the comfort and complacency and self-interest of the city. And um, he would say, listen, if you're too invested in the world that you live in, then you cannot be a challenge to it. John the Baptist stands apart, and he is the voice crying in the wilderness. And you see what he does? He calls the people into the wilderness, out of the city. And I don't know if you see the significance of that, but it is brilliant, actually, if you think about it, that um, they left Jerusalem, the holy city, they returned into the wilderness, they went to the River Jordan, and that is essentially reversing the journey that their forefathers, that their ancestors had done when they arrived in the Promised Land. They go back to the Jordan, they go back to the place where they started, and there they are baptized, enter back into the River Jordan, Do you see the symbolism of that? They're saying, listen, this whole thing, this whole project, this whole thing has not worked. We want to start all over again. We want a new beginning. There's a real sort of humility in it, uh, a, 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 a willingness to ask God to forgive them and to give them the chance to start all over again. It's a really profound thing that he is doing. And um, he preaches this message. A message of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And if there's a heart to this sermon and to this message, I think that's it. I think we should hear that. Imagine the journey that the people of God went on back to their origins. The humility of saying, listen, we've messed this up. We want to start again. We want a new beginning. And that's the message that John is preaching. And what Mark is writing here isn't just a lovely story about the things that Jesus did. It has a purpose. 
It's here for us. He's writing with you in mind. And he does this intentionally. What is the start of the gospel? What's the starting place in this life that he is calling us to? It's repentance. It's repentance. It's the only starting place that there is. We tend to start in other places. Um, There's a really interesting quote by a second century apologist called Tertullian. And he says, uh, just as Jesus was crucified between two thieves, so the good news, so the gospel, is crucified between two errors, two thieves that will rob you of life and joy. And they are these. The first is the sort of moralism that says, I have earned this. I am good enough for this. Through my moral life or my religious practice, I am owed this. It's the picture of the older brother in the story of the prodigal son. He says, I've earned this. This is my right. It's the Pharisees in the gospel stories. It's any of us who think that uh, we're not like other people, that we're better. That kind of moralism is one of the errors which robs us of life and joy. The other is the kind of, I don't know, the license that says, um, it doesn't really matter what you do. It doesn't, God's bigger than that, you know. Do what you like. Do what feels good. We know best. You know, it's that process of sort of self-justifying, of thinking that we know better than God. It's obviously the story of the prodigal son himself, the one who said to God, listen, I don't, I don't need you. Just give me my inheritance and I'm going to spend it as I wish. I'm going to do whatever I want. Those are the two errors. The truth The way of the gospel is repentance. That willingness to say, no, I have gone astray. I have sinned. I have fallen short of the glory of God. And in humbly turning back to God, I find him like the father in the story of the prodigal son, waiting with open arms to welcome us home. Repentance says I take responsibility for my failures, for my part in the brokenness of this world and how it has gone wrong. But in repentance, there I find forgiveness and the mercy of God. That's the place of grace. That is the good news. You can't earn this. You do need this. John the Baptist says, repent and be baptized and your sins will be forgiven. And perhaps we tonight just need that kind of moment to say, I need to go back to. I need to remember my baptism, where I began. I need to recognize the ways that I've drifted in one direction or another. And to hear this invitation to return and to find the new beginnings and the new life which Christ offers us. John the Baptist is this amazing, uncomfortable figure, yes, but he's so important. And remember that what he's doing is he is pointing us to the one who is the good news. Verse seven, this was his message. After me comes one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I'm not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Ultimately, John the Baptist points us to Jesus. And the good news isn't simply a message or a philosophy, it is a person. A person who stands at the very center of history, perhaps the greatest person of all, and yet one who lives this life of radical simplicity and humility and gives himself for the sake of the world and for you and I. So this is the beginning of the good news. It's not a bad beginning, is it? But it's an invitation to find out what's next. This is the job of the Gospels as we read them, to do their work in our hearts, to call us, just as they have called people throughout history, to that new beginning that is found in Christ. Repent and believe that you might be forgiven, that you might be restored to the relationship with God where you will find life and light and hope. And we point ourselves and one another to Jesus Because he is the good news. The gospel takes us back to our roots, reminds us who we are and where we come from. 
It strips away the baggage and the mistakes and the wrong turns, and it allows us to travel light and to travel in the direction that we are called to do so. So as we begin this, over these coming weeks, we're going to be looking at this good news as it unfolds. Will you come with me on this journey? You are invited to to begin again, to humble yourself, to learn again what all of this means. To encounter Jesus once more, as if for the first time. This is the adventure of faith that we are called upon. Come with me as we travel it together.